Hello again. We are Chris Lee, Blake Lovell, and Max Barr. <laughs> I can't even. Like, I can't even hide my. Are, are those my even really enthusiasm. our last names? We, like, we got a we got a discussion of that. Coming. I can't even hold my enthusiasm back for this particular sequence that's about to come after the intro. I just I can't. But continue, please. Please finish the intro first. Yeah, give give me about sixty seconds. We're here to discuss South Carolina's thing it did in Knoxville last night and then that wild Ole Miss Mississippi State game those were the two games of Tuesday night and and boy did they both deliver in various ways before we get into those this is brought to you by bet online it is playoff time the road through Vegas has gone through San Francisco and Baltimore left two teams standing bet online is your number one source for football playoff odds stats trends and lines from everything but point spreads to hundreds of player performance props, head to Bet Online today. Stay updated on all the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Well, gentlemen, South Carolina, Tennessee was over before it started. The, the, the poor Vols had no chance uh, because we had issued the Southeastern 14 kiss of death. The Gamecocks. Talon Cooper, B.J. Mack, Miles Studi. They just went through the Food City Center, went up and down the aisles with their shopping cart, and just took what they wanted and left Knoxville with the win. Like, I don't even know where to start. There's so many places we can go, but I'll... Oh, I know first. exactly where to start. <laughs> Do you realize that I'm starting to figure out the power that I hold as the yes. person who picks last with the predictions? Every single time I'm starting to realize that there's a lot of weight on my shoulders to get this right, because when you two schlubs pick the same team, I have to make the decision. Do I go with what the basketball numbers and computers are telling me to maybe go along with your charade here? Or do I do a fan base a favor and pick the other team just to make sure that this game can go one of two ways instead of just one way. So I really thought about that when we made our picks for this Tennessee-South Carolina game. I said, you know, am I really going to do this? And ultimately, I did. Ultimately, I went with Tennessee the same as you two. However, someone on this here panel made the decision to take this a step further, the likes of which we've not seen before on the Southeastern 14 <laughs> YouTube channel. We've never had a declarative statement the way that we got from this person right here. So folks, I take you back two days ago, Monday, January the 29th, as we are recording this. And here is what you heard in case you may have missed it here on Southeastern 14. What we have done is we have broken the curse that Lamont Paris has over us right now, because there is no way Oh. losing this game oh no no way oh wow there's no oh, way southeastern 14 kiss of death wow is what we have there's done. no way <clears throat> you, you know what blake you you got a lot to feel bad about but so does max after that wow listen guys there's levels to this game there's levels to this and all i was doing was guaranteeing <laughs> no, that's what in, all honesty, in all honesty. I had forgotten that I had said that, and I'm watching the old miss game. And Blake texts us and goes, Max, do you realize what you did on that preview video? And I'm going, Oh no, oh, they're gonna they're gonna eat me alive. I'm I'm afraid of Lamont Paris, I'm scared. I'm I'm afraid I'm lost. I'm in I'm in hiding right now. Hey, Lamont Paris is out for us, and I'm in hiding. Uh, this we have a little visual representation of what what Lamont Paris has done to us, Blake. I was gonna say if you're if you're scared, if you're in hiding, there's someone there to save you, because he's always there to save the day and make you feel better. And you know who that is. That's daddy. <laughs> because daddy's home, Max. 
And let me just tell you folks right now, if you are listening to this on the podcast feed, I know I say this a lot, but this is the one where it is worth your time. Now, don't get fired from your job or anything, but I promise you, it is worth your time to go to YouTube right now and find the SEC basketball reaction video that is titled with something like South Carolina upsets Tennessee just to see the visual that you're going to see around the five and a half minute mark here of Max Barr standing over me. And by the way, I, I've been in the gym, as you can tell. <laughs> but the, the one that you can really, really lay your eyes on here is Lamont Paris' father standing over and just giving a nice little lovable bear hug here to what can only be described as... <laughs> Actually, I don't even know how to describe it. I really don't. I have no idea how to describe what I'm seeing on the screen here with Chris. It looks Lee. like a chokehold to me. No, I, I'm I not think... even the one who committed the most violence against Lamont Paris. Chris, here. Chris looks like the child who knows he's in trouble, and he just realizes that he's been caught. Like that's exactly what Chris looks like right here. So, and, and I, what I like about this too, this is Daddy's home too, because this is the sequel from the, the last time. time. Yeah, you know, yeah, the Kentucky game. So, but and we're just gonna we're gonna finish with this, and then I promise we're gonna get into the game because we like to have fun here. But Ugh. when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, <sighs> fathers know fa father knows best, guys. All right, I told you that. I said it in the preview. I said we got to remember something here. We're all doing this, but we know who knows best, and there you see him right in the middle of the screen, Lamont Paris, surrounded by. I mean, I don't think it's us three because, I mean, I don't, I don't know. But still, I mean, it's just th these are the people that picked against Lamont Paris in South Carolina. These are these are four other people who picked against them. Yeah. So, <clears throat> anyways, <sighs> that that was amazing last night. I mean, I, I did. Well, now we'll, we'll be a little more serious. I, I keep thinking this is going to run out. The, the computers say. South oh. Carolina is all oh, I know. Here we go. Here but we I'm, go. I'm just telling you that they have said all along this is maybe a you know a lower level top 50 team. You're not playing like it. At some point that stuff stops mattering. Um hey, we we have we have declared Food City Center the, the fortress. Nobody walks into Food City Center and 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 walks out with the win. I mean, you, you saw what happened in Alabama two weeks ago. And, and by the way, it, it, Lamont Pierce has done this twice now. He took a South Carolina team to Kentucky last year. You know, this this team's 15 points better than that team probably. And maybe not 15, but a dozen and, and, and one there. I mean, first of all, watching that game last night, there were parts of it that looked like um, both teams hadn't shot a basketball in two weeks and were rusty. I, I think that's a testament to what South Carolina does, though. It, it, it mucks up the game. T Talon Cooper, not not underrated by us, but probably the most under talked about player in the league. I mean, th this guy's doing work. Assist to turnover ratio four to one. Max, you said you said in our private chat last night, our text message, you said, like he just hits a big shot every time they need it. Right after he hit a three with I don't know four or five minutes, and then he hits another one, probably the biggest shot of the game down the stretch. Um, Carolina gets Miles Studi back. He had some huge free throws down the stretch. Look, I thought Dalton Connect was going to win it by himself. That that possession they had, they're down, what was it, four or five points. They get the ball knocked away. He goes in the backcourt, yep. gets it, brings it up the left side, and just drills this off-balance three with a guy right on him that you're going, man, this guy's – he's like a superhero. But But – Carolina was good enough. It made the plays at the end and overcame it, Max. Yeah, I mean, this South Carolina defense is no joke. They they keep everything in front. They don't allow penetration and get into rotations with open threes, and they're just rock solid. I think it all starts with Cooper. I think Cooper's the, the captain of the defense, and he's got the clutch gene on offense. I didn't know that Studi was going to be back. By the way, I don't. I don't know if any of us did, but my gosh, well, back three of three of preview. Yeah, I mean, they said on Monday that he'd be available. Now, of course, that's mm. different than he's going to play, but they did say he'd be available on Monday, so yeah. we didn't know for sure. But yeah, yeah, but I mean, 
I mean, just just look at look at Cooper and and Studi, a combined seven for eight from three. You know, that's just. It, it seemed like every time that Tennessee started to claw back, Cooper would be found with like a half second of space, and boom, that one's in. Um, and then I got some pushback for it, but on our on our live reaction show uh, Saturday night, I just posed the question. I said, you know, do we ever get to a time? Do we ever get to a game where? Dalton connects 30 points isn't enough and he has no help. And we're like, well, they need something else. And I think we saw it here against one of the better defenses in the conference, other than a few threes from Vescovy. I mean, really there was nothing else other than connect. Um, and I think it was a little bit of, I think a lot of it of was, was the South Carolina defense, but a little bit, was it also Tennessee just trying to kind of not force feed them, but just being a little bit one dimensional offensively. But I don't think this is like a I, – I, I find it hard to take away anything negatively from from South Carolina here. I think they implemented their game plan. They did what they wanted to do. Same thing like they did against Kentucky. And I think the negatives here are are pulling away from Tennessee. I think they've got a little bit of a, a one-dimensional offense issue. A um, little bit concerning, but not the end of the world. Blake, what are you thinking? You know me, I'm not one to overreact. <clears throat> so this is the first stinker from Tennessee this yep. season. So I don't think we should go too far just yet. There's 20 games in the first game that they've looked like they've looked concerning, you know, realistically. Mississippi State loss, I didn't think that was that concerning. Um, the other three games in non-conference play, I didn't think it was that concerning. So this is the one where it's just like, mm, those offensive things, there they are. Just when we all set up. They're not going to have any of those, and, well, they kind of did there. Um, but, no, it's it's a good point. I think w- I'm curious to see how they respond because, obviously, not ideal because you have to respond by going to Kentucky on Saturday and three or next four on the road now. And so, yes, I think that's a, that's a good point to bring up. I will say that if there's one thing that we did bring up in the preview as, go- as I was going back and, you know, clipping the, the quote from Max <laughs> – there was something that I said, um, which I don't, I don't often get a lot right, but I said, here's how South Carolina can beat Tennessee. They have to play like Tennessee. They have to be physical. They have to bump them around. That's exactly what they did again. This is the formula. They figured it out. Like Kentucky, they bumped Kentucky around. Kentucky wanted no part of it. They bumped Tennessee around. Tennessee was not excited about it. Um, and I know there's some Tennessee fans. They were not excited about three guys in particular uh, who were not wearing a basketball uniform, but another type of uniform. I know they weren't pleased um, at, at some of the things and how they played out in that regard, but it was a very physical game and we knew it was going to be because I, you know, I'd called South Carolina, Tennessee light or whatever. I didn't say it in that many terms, but I said, they're starting to build an identity mm-hmm. that is kind of close to what we've seen Tennessee do to teams and South Carolina just did it to Tennessee. and. They made them take hard shots. Now, did Tennessee miss some shots they're usually going to make? Probably. But it, they got nothing easy, and that was the point, is they they didn't make it easy just like they didn't against Kentucky. And so, sure, it helped that South Carolina hit 10 threes. They hit not just 10 threes. They hit multiple threes at big moments where I text you guys. I said, Tennessee's down three with whatever, I don't know, four or five minutes to go. I said, it should might as well be 15 because I don't see yeah. Tennessee scoring enough points to win. And I just said, I think South Carolina's winning this game because I, I, you know, Tennessee felt like they were down double digits when they were down three points. And so, yes, all that to say that once again, it was the perfect game plan. They made Tennessee uncomfortable. They did again to Tennessee, what Tennessee does to pretty much every team that walks into that gym. And like we said, remember only one team had played Tennessee within 18 points in, in Thompson bowling, food city, lion center, chicken, whatever. Um, and that was Illinois and South Carolina comes in, they hold Tennessee to 59 points. They win. And yeah, I mean, I, that's all South Carolina's got to do now. They're using their physicality and Hey, for, force the, force the guys in the striped shirts to make a decision. And, you know, there was a game, it felt like at times it was like two halves where the first half, it felt like it was. You know, things were kind of free-flowing a little bit. They didn't call a ton, but then the second half, you know, then it got a little bit 
early on, you know, you start to pick up some hand checks here, there, and that kind of stuff. But I mean, it's a physical game. And to me, you guys may look around, but I'm going to tell you right now, if I power rank the most physical teams in the SEC right now, I might put South Carolina at the top and Tennessee might be number two, or you can swip, you can swap the order depending on the games. But as I look around, that's one of the reasons why South Carolina is having much success is because they are not, the mod pair said it, the exact quote, like we don't back down. They don't back down from anybody. And that's why they won the game. Real quick, before we move on, I just want to note that Alabama is a six point favorite on the road today at Georgia. If Georgia is able to pull off that upset, South Carolina shares a lead of first place in the SEC after eight games. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we're almost to the halfway point. I mean, South Carolina's at the point, I don't know if there's like a magic number of wins, but I think, I don't know, conservatively speaking, five more probably gets Carolina in the tournament. Net ranking goes from 48 to 39 today. I mean, what, 17 and three overall? And I know the out of conference body of work wasn't wasn't tremendous, but there's a win in there over Virginia Tech. There's one over Grand Canyon. Uh, there was a loss in there to Clemson. That's it. That's not really going to go against Carolina. It was on the road. Clemson's an NCAA tournament caliber team. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting to the point. We're just almost counting down how many wins do we need to, to get Carolina in the tournament. Um, Think about and this look, too. Sure. Just to add to that real quickly before we move to the next subject. The remaining on their schedule okay they get tennessee at home they go to auburn there's no kentucky there's no alabama they've already played those two so like when you look at the schedule and how it shapes up they get old miss at home vanderbilt at home lsu at home florida at mm -hmm. home you know go to old miss go to a&m go to mississippi state those are all winnable so yeah Blake, I, I was thinking as you were talking about how you, you'd kind of named the recipe for Carolina to win this one, and Carolina went out and did it. it. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to go and do it in that building where th that's Tennessee's game. I mean, South Carolina kind of bullied the bully in its building in that way. That Not, not many teams, again, do that. N number two, and I think I know what you guys are going to say, but I've got to ask the question. Panic level on Tennessee would would be an overstatement, but level of concern I think would be more like it. What is our level of concern with Tennessee? I'm, I'm going to give you a little preamble. Let's go back to a year ago. Between December 31st and January 25th, Connecticut lost five of seven games. You know what happened. Connecticut ended up winning the national championship and doing it in really impressive fashion. This is why I say again and again, I start paying a lot more attention in mid-February to me this is a game, it's not It's not a level of concern. No, it is a level of concern if, if what we saw last night continues to show up. But I just think Tennessee's got so many pieces that it is not getting optimal production from that, that we have seen can do better. My level of concern on Tennessee is pretty low. Now look, it, it's out there, it has shown up. If it persists, then it becomes a level of concern. But I, I don't really... This is a game that I think Rick Barnes is a really good coach. And I think he can use it. Th this might be exactly what Tennessee needs because I felt Tennessee was the best team in the league going into the week. That's how I ranked the balls in the power rankings. I didn't think it was, I'm not going to say it wasn't close because there are other teams that could beat them, but I thought it was an easy decision based on quality of team and body of work. I, I think we could look back at the end of March and say, this is exactly what this team needed. And maybe this was the turning point. We'll see. Yeah, I think right now the biggest thing that's holding them back offensively is, well, we've we've talked about the guards and, and what they have to do, but I think the glaring issue is you're not getting anything from Josiah Jordan-James right now. He's only scoring three, mm -hmm. points a, three points a game in SEC play. Um, I think he's I think he's only had one made shot in the past few games. Yeah, one made shot in the past three games. So he was averaging double digits over the course of the first month or so. So I think his 
his kind of offensive drop off with Adu getting in foul trouble in this game kind of was a perfect storm to and plus I mean we can't just say this is a Tennessee issue I, South Carolina's defense is as legit as it gets as we're seeing so I don't I don't I'm not I'm the overreacting guy and I'm not overreacting so if that holds any weight then there's that the thing with James is he's not taking shots yeah I mean, you know, if, if they feel like he needs to score more, then he needs to take more shots because right now he's taking about three a game. So, I mean, I don't know if I – yeah, I mean, it's probably not all on him. I mean, if they're going to find ways to get him more involved, he was scoring more because he was taking more shots. And so I don't know how they – yeah, maybe there's there's something to that and how they figure out – and, I mean, just – Sky Ziegler's not going to have a game like he had last night. That that's That's an outlier, right? I just don't think he's – We'll get to that in a second in terms of the fantasy yeah. impact of that. But I just, I don't think, you know, he's not going to often go 0 of 6 from the floor and 2 of 4 from the free throw line. Right. And keep in mind, too, Tennessee is a 75% free throw shooting team, top 50 in the country. They missed eight free throws last night. And so, you know, it's something else where you just, how many teams in the SEC have had a bad week this year? About all well, of I them. I know the number. I know the number. <laughs> 14. Like yeah. everybody's had a bad week this year. So Tennessee just lost one game at home. It was ugly. It was really ugly, but they just lost one game at home. And so I, I'm not overreacting at all. Uh, could they go lose to Kentucky on Saturday? Sure they could. And that could be their bad week. But do I think they'll bounce back next week when they play LSU at home on Wednesday? Probably. And so I'm, I'm not overreacting. This is where, it's easy for people on the outside or people to say, all right, well, Tennessee just lost to South Carolina at home in late January. That means they're going to lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament. No, it's not, it's not how this works. Like it's not how this works. So you, you can't just say that like, there's no, you can't correlate the two. Um, now there are things you could take away from this game that if they do lose in the first week of March in the NCAA tournament or whatever, Maybe there's something in this game you look back on and say, hey, that was one of those things that stood out that may have been an issue. Uh, but for now, it's one game. Tennessee had not looked like that at home in a long time. And, yeah, I, again, I don't I don't want to take this too far in the direction of Tennessee. This was South Carolina winning the game. This was yes. not Tennessee losing yes. the game, in my personal opinion. Now, could Tennessee have done some things better? Sure. And Tennessee probably did some things bad that they don't normally do that bad. But South Carolina was the one that made the big shots when it mattered. And like I said, I know there's some frustrations. I've seen it on social media from Tennessee fans with how the game was officiated at times. Um, but, I mean, again, Tennessee just kind of had issues. And, and they could not sort of adapt to the way that the game was, you know, being called or however you want to put it. Uh, if that's the way you viewed it. So, yeah, South Carolina made the plays. They won the game. And I don't think we just need to, like I said, remember, this isn't the outlier for South Carolina anymore. This is the norm now. Yeah, Like, this is what they're doing. So this should not be that surprising based on, and I think I said, I, I, I said in the preview, I'd be very surprised if Tennessee came out and blew South Carolina out of the building. I just didn't see it happening with the way these two teams play, the styles, all that. You just felt like South Carolina, if they could do exactly what they did in terms of the game plan, they had a chance here. We didn't pick it. We didn't predict it. The computers didn't predict it. Not many people predicted it because Tennessee was a, what, 14-point favorite max? Is that what it was? Yeah. Um, but some nights you execute the game plan just as it needs to be executed, and the other team doesn't play well, and it's a combination of the two, and the Gamecocks with another victory. All right, we, we got another game to discuss. It was a good one, too. And before we go there, I want your quick reaction on one more thing. And Blake's going to accuse me of trying to jinx his fantasy basketball team here. But I watched Tennessee, and, and it feels like like if you freeze them in time right now and just watch the last few, it feels like that offense, and this is probably an overstatement, is everybody stands around and waits for Dalton Connect to, to make a play. That, that again, that's probably an overstatement. I'm trying to get across a, a, a concept here, but I feel like Rick Barnes is going to know that he's going to have to get more 
than that out of his supporting guys, as we've talked about. And I wonder if you'll see connects, not to say his role in the offense decrease, because I think when they need a big shot, you know where you need to go. And you you, you don't want to have him scoring 10 points a game and take him out of it. But I, I do wonder if things will be restructured offensively to get some other guys going, like Josiah Jordan James and Vescovy, who did give him 10 last night. And, and if there will be some tweaks based on, on that alone. I, I could I could see that. I think that's in the I I think that's a probably a good idea to do. Just get a little bit more balance. I mean, and you don't want to be I mean, balance is a good thing. You know, look at look at South Carolina. Cooper 18, but Max 16, Studi 13. A nice a nice little three-headed scoring uh scoring monster on the road. Nice, nice and balanced. Tennessee just has not had balance at all. And I think the just a little bit more balance would make the offense come a little bit easier and not such a small margin for error, but I think that would be a good thing, yeah. I don't know. I just can't help but think there's a little bit of an overreaction. I mean, they, they basically had five guys in double figures at Vanderbilt. Alabama, they just blew out. They had four guys in double figures. Like, it's it makes sense that everything runs through Connect because he's the best sure. player easily on the floor. Right. And... Yes, but there are going to be times where, sure, he may have to force things because he did have to force some in this one, or he's not having his best game. Then, yes, I think you got to have somebody else step up. Um, I understand what you guys are saying. I'm just, I, I still think though, it's like, it's just, it's the luxury of having someone like that. Where, yeah, sure, there are going to be times where people are just going to defer to him, and if he has a bad game, then yeah, maybe. But I mean, I don't know. You know, it's like. I just, but the fact is, he do, he doesn't have many bad games. Like he just doesn't, and like he's just he's on another level. So, I, I, I will reserve judgment on Tennessee until after the Kentucky game, because that's a game where we talked about Kentucky's defensive issues at times and all that. Um, I, I'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll see if there's any panic after the Kentucky game. But I just think this is. To me, this was a combination of a lot of things, and a lot of it had to do with South Carolina and the way they play. So, Contrast that with Old Miss, which found offensive balance last night. It defended its home court with an 86-82 win over Mississippi State and one that went down to the wire. Jalen Murray, probably the, the key figure in that game, 21 points, 11 assists, hits some hit some big shots for Old Miss last night, which he's done – in other games other than that, Matt Morrell was really good again, gave him 20 points. Breakfield gives him 10, hit a big shot or two. Caldwell, TJ Caldwell, I don't I don't think that was on the bingo card for big games, but he gave Ole Miss 18 points. Look, Ole Miss shoots threes pretty well in its building. We've talked about the home road split. 12 of 30 from three last night. And the Rebels hold on at the end uh, to get a win. Josh Hubbard really, I thought, was the story of the first half, but was less of a factor in the second half. Uh, Blake, your your immediate thoughts on Ole Miss's win over Mississippi State. Can't go to me first on this one. What are you doing? Oh, okay. We, we defer to Max then. Well, Max is the Ole Miss well, that, guy. That's you true. Every where, where's, time. where's my head? <laughs> what are I'm, you I'm doing? So, I'm so disoriented from, from what South Carolina did last night that I've, well, I've lost second, my Chris. way. Hold on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was yep. just going to say, look at what Lamont Paris has done to us. When, when a man's in a chokehold, he doesn't think straight. Max That's Barr, you're, you're our resident Ole Miss hug. guy. The floor is yours, sir. This was one of those heart and soul games. This was one of those heart and soul games. I was left exhausted after watching this one. <laughs> I think you were going to say that. I knew. I could just Wait, see. Can like, we just put this on loop? When you were saying heart Listen. and soul, I was like, he's not talking about the players. He's talking about himself. Yes. I put everything I had into this game. <laughs> um, listen, first off, I just want to say similar to how Chris, I think it was on Saturday, you texted us and we're like, I don't think, I don't remember a Florida, Georgia game being this entertaining, this intense, this level of an atmosphere. I can't, I don't know how long it's been. Same thing with this game. You get a, you get a record crowd at Ole Miss. The place is going nuts. Mississippi State shows up. They're not scared. They're not afraid. Josh Hubbard with 16 in the first half. He's not your average freshman. So I just thought I thought the game lived up to the entertainment factor. I mean, it was it was great. Um, 
I thought that besides Josh Hubbard, I thought Ole Miss did a decent job on Tolu Smith. One, because I have Tolu Smith in fantasy and he only got me seven points. Two, because that was a major factor in the real game, which is more important. But um, I thought that C- uh, Cissé and his fouls were were really big because Jamarian Sharp just does not have the physicality to keep Tolu Smith out of the paint and the, with the rebounding and Jimmy Bell. So I thought Sharp was really getting – was really having a tough game. And Rashad Marshall, the freshman, he hasn't played in a while. He comes in and plays some great minutes. Breakfield plays 38 minutes, a lot of those minutes at the five and a little bit of a small ball lineup. I just thought that no ma- whoever came out with a win of this game, it was going to be one of those – man, you just got to be happy with a win because this was a hard-fought game and you found a way to come out on top. I don't have the exact numbers. Um, Blake, you might or may not. I'm not sure, but there's some stat about Ole Miss in the five-point games this year and how they're they're like undefeated in in these tight games. So they're just some way, somehow, they are finding a way to win down the stretch. Before I move on, though, to you, Blake, I do want to note – I think Cam Matthews is the best defender like in the country. The amount of plays that he individually blew up and just completely took took a half of the court away because of his individual defense, it was driving me crazy from an Ole Miss perspective. So Cam Matthews had an unbelievable game, but I was just I was floored with the I mean 86, 82. I think this total went like 30 points over. Yeah, I mean I I thought both games were going to be similar in terms of the, the Tennessee South Carolina game went about as expected from a scoring standpoint. Figured right. it was over scoring this one much higher uh here. But look, it's Ole Miss hitting threes, man. I mean, we said it. I I pointed out, I'm like, you know, look at their road splits. And I shot the ball well on the road. And what did they do? They went and did that against Texas AM. Now they come back home to the friendly confines and hit, you know, 12 threes here. And yeah, I mean, that's been the difference this year. Like we said, if the, why are they such an improved offensive team? Cause they're shooting it well. And specifically when they get the opportunities at home, they are taking advantage of it. I'm really glad that I, I drafted Juju Murray. Cause man, he got me a lot of points in the <laughs> fantasy this week. So, um, you know, yeah, next week I, I may draft someone else, but he was a great pick for me this week. Yeah. 21 points, you know, four threes, 11 assists. That's a, that's a lot of fantasy points right there. He had a steal and a block too. So, I'm curious to see what the updated fantasy stats are here in a second. But, um, yeah, I mean, I look, if you go back through Ole Miss's schedule, the Detroit Mercy by one, Sam Houston State by three, Temple by one, Memphis by three, UCF by two. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. And then they beat A&M by three, Mississippi State by four. So how many that is, I told you guys, I said, everybody was talking about their schedule. And how, well, they didn't really play anybody and all this. I said, but here's the thing. Because they're winning so many close games early, when they get into SEC play, they've been here before, they've been in these spots, they understand what it takes to close out some of these close games. And now they've done that in back-to-back games and two huge wins that are, you know, catapulting them into the NCAA tournament as of right now. And that's why. It's because I think they are able to draw back on sort of the confidence they built from winning some of those games early, even against a bad team or a good team. It didn't matter. They were just able to win those close games. And I think that, again, accounts for something. You see their confidence. You see them find ways to make plays. Um, And, yeah, I mean, I thought this was – and, look, Sharp has not really been a factor the last two games, right, at all. I mean, he's not had a block or anything. He's only played not a lot of minutes. But I think, you know, it's just like you look at – this is what we said, Max. Like, it's the – the overall roster and the depth and what they have to work with. Um, it's just, yeah, there's so many guys that have stepped up. We mentioned, I mean, you said it, Chris, like Caldwell. And of course, Murray's been as good as he's been this season and all that. I mean, it is just, this team has a lot of good pieces and it is wild. And it felt like the perfect night to have these two games because now you look up and you combine the two together in South Carolina and Ole Miss are 36 and six right now combined. And it is just a remarkable thing to think about based on where these two teams have been in recent seasons. South Carolina goes four and 14 in the conference last year. Ole Miss goes three and 15, right? Um, 
you know, year before South Carolina won nine, Ole Miss went one four in the conference. Um, you know, these are just two teams that have kind of hovered in that bottom half of the SEC, sometimes closer to the bottom. Uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see them both move to this incredible 18 and three record here as we about to enter February. And both are in the NCAA tournament right now and are moving on up in terms of the, the, the seed line. So, Blake, you mentioned Ole Miss winning, my words, not yours, a disproportionate number of close games. Ken Pomeroy has a stat to track this. And the very name of it, I think, makes people mad because I think it's sort of a misnomer. He calls it luck. It's basically what people who study these things for a living have done, as they've said, generally, if you score – X amount of points, and, and you give up X amount of points over time, your your record should be this. And, and again, over time, it holds up. But in, in smaller sample size with teams for seasons, it doesn't always do that. And that is the basis for what Ken Pomeroy calls luck, for probably for lack of a better term, because how you condense all that to, to one word otherwise. But anyway, Ole Miss number one in the country in luck ratings right now. And the, the metric that he uses to do it, it's point one seven seven. Uh Quinnipiac is point one seven five. The next team is Northern Arizona at point one five three. Uh, and then you drop off as you get into the low twenty. South Carolina's twenty, by the way. So as you mentioned, Carolina kind of that category at point one one three also. Anyway, all that to say. Yeah, there's there's a role in that too, and and not only is Ole Miss overperforming its record a little bit by that measure, but it's it's kind of out ahead by a bit too. So again, I I think teams should be judged by tournament performance. Ole Miss will, as Blake said, Ole Miss is in, and and Ole Miss I think fifty two fifty three in the net today. So I think the Rebels would be in the tournament. But if anybody's wondering, I'm, I'm not saying any of this to to diss Ole Miss, uh, because again we know. This is the team that played without some parts early. It's a team that had a lot of new parts. It's got a new coach. It takes some times for teams to gel. I think what Ole Miss is playing like right now is what it is, and I would disregard some of that stuff earlier, is that was a team without some guys trying to find its footing. But anyway, all, all that to say, if you see a discrepancy between where Ole Miss is and the net and other computer rankings and the record and all those things, in the resume, that that's the best way to explain it. We want to get to a little fantasy update here to wrap up. We got, let's see where we got. Let's pull it up. Quick, quick rundown of the, the fantasy. Only two games last night, so we didn't have a lot of players to play. Uh, not the best scoring day out of, out of all of us. Um, Chris had two guys go. Morrell had 23, made a few threes, um, but surprisingly didn't have any steals or blocks. Usually he's a defensive guy that, that racks up a few defensive numbers. So normally that number for Morrell would be a little bit higher. And then Adu was with, in foul trouble most of the game. Um, so he only puts up 15 last two weeks ago when Blake had him. He put up 40 and 40 both weeks. Um, connect with 39. He just had a lot of missed shots. That that brought his his total down a little bit, but still thirty nine is a good good performance. Ziegler, that is our that is our week three now. We're through three weeks. That is our lowest individual performance. That but that's not the norm. That's not the norm with Ziegs. He usually racks it up, and it'll then be it'll be fine. Yeah, Ziegs will be fine. And then Flanagan um, does a lot of his damage defensively and on the boards. He, he Flanagan's a pretty much one of our most rock solid guys. Um, as far as a floor is concerned. And then Tolu Smith was as a sacrificial lamb for Ole Miss winning, so I'll I'll take it. Um, but we have a lot of work to make up uh, tonight. So there's your fantasy update uh, after Tuesday. Follow along. Follow us on Twitter, 14 Southeastern. Well, hold on a second. Where's, where's Juju Murray? I thought he was on my team. Oh, yeah. I, I forgot. I, Didn't I, I, think, I think he was on there instead of Ziegler from what I remember in the draft. Is that right? Then I draft have, Murray over Ziegler. I, I think you're yeah, I think I did. So let's update that. Um Max, there's a little undercurrent under this that's that's not been put on the screen, I believe. What's that? Well, oh boy, I got here nine, we go. All got right. a nine year old. So this the, this may be the week we get beat oh, by a nine year old. Yeah. He he begs to play in this every week. I say, buddy, we can't do that. 
I said, what I'll let you do for fun is I'll let you pick a team of all the guys we didn't draft and see how you do. And, and that's my bribery to get them out of bed in the morning for school because, buddy, let me tell you, it it is brutal. I mean, it's it's getting him to the school bus is a chore. I, I told him this morning, I said, buddy, Juju Murray, he, who he drafted, had a good game. Let's go add up the scores. That got him out of bed. But um, th- this could be the week we get beat by a nine-year-old who who picked from all our leftovers. And Murray yeah. has 52, right? Yes. Yeah, so Here's Murray. A shocker, Max. Murray Chris is already yeah. declaring a win on Tuesday um, after Tuesday's <laughs> games. Well, he's never wow. done that before, has he? That's never happened before. A member of the Lee family has never declared victory after one <laughs> set of games, which only included two games, period. It's, it's over. Before. It's over. Yeah, it's over. Why should we even play the rest of the week? Oh, oh there are more games. I forgot. So, sorry, Chris. There are more check games. I got our previews play. of tonight's games, too. Previewed every game. Yeah, check out all our wrong picks for tonight's games. You can find that on Sunday's <laughs> 14. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Florida. You're next. Congratulations <laughs> to the Florida Gators. You are next up in this long line of just embarrassing. Georgia, I was to say this, Georgia, you're welcome. Alabama, you're welcome. Like I, I've done both of you favors in that game because, again, I seem to hold the power here unless Max decides that there's no way that the other team's going to win. What we have done is we have Ooh. broken oh, yeah. the curse that Lamont mm. Paris has over us right now because there is no way. No way. <laughs> wow. Be South Carolina me. fans. Reach out um, and thank your boy, Max Barr, here for the You're victory. welcome. You're welcome. I'll take things said by people who are losing for 800, please, Alex. Oh, God, that's, that's where we are. <laughs> it's been a week. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Exciting night of basketball ahead for us on Wednesday. We'll have that recapped probably Thursday morning. We, we toy with the idea every now and then of, of going live um, when, when we have time and when the occasion suits it. So you, you never know. Best way to to know that's coming, hit the notifications button. Hit the subscribe button. That's free. Give us nice ratings. If you listen to us on a podcast venue, give us a, a five-star there if you like it. Give us a like. Those things help our analytics help us get found. For Blake Lovell and Max Barr, I'm Chris Lee. This is Southeastern 14 presented by Bet Online.